the tomb was an exact scale replica of real China. The idea obviously was to represent in microcosm the entire sphere over which he ruled. Based on an ancient Chinese text written by Sima Qian 100 years after the emperor's death, ancient model maker Richard Windley has reconstructed the layout of the tomb. These, um, these accounts imply that this map was actually fairly accurate in its detail. We've got the main rivers. It's probably likely that um, the terrain was actually fairly um, accurately constructed as well. For the rivers, Qin did not use water. Instead, he filled the channels with mercury. Mercury is a metal unlike any other. It is liquid at room temperature. This unique property fascinated the ancient Chinese and gave it mystical significance. So I think this idea of mercury as the enigmatic substance that defies nature may be the reason that explains why people thought that it could also extend their own lives. But creating whole rivers made of thousands of tons of mercury was not the most amazing part. Chin's engineers also designed an ancient turbine that drove the liquid metal around the tomb. After the first emperor died, his successor had the skilled workmen who'd worked on the tomb buried alive in order to preserve the secrets. For that reason, probably, we don't know how the mercury was propelled around the model. Sima Chen simply says that it was some mechanism, and he obviously didn't know the details himself. Richard Windley is working with leading academics to speculate how this feat of hydraulics might have been achieved. Janice Lee is the senior curator of the site and one of its greatest worldwide authorities. Do you think we've got a reasonable representation here? Yeah. The experts have come up with a theory that may give us new insights into how the Mercury Rivers were caused to flow around the tomb. Archaeological evidence from the same period shows that the ancient Chinese were proficient with the water wheel and the axle. We know there were underground streams in the area. It would have been fairly easy, given the technology of the time, to harness these to some kind of water mill that could have driven the mercury around the tomb. What I've decided to go with to solve these problems in, in model form is a horizontal water wheel. This is driving a kind of paddle wheel. So effectively, we've got a horizontal wheel driving a vertical wheel. Richard fills the model rivers with a mercury substitute and turns on the flow to simulate the action of the real underground rivers. It rather looks as though it's working actually and it's, it seems to have settled down and it's all actually working quite nicely. Water from the river is directed down a channel onto a horizontal water wheel and away into the earth. This is connected via a right angled gearing system to a vertical water wheel which pushes the mercury round the tomb. As long as the water source still flowed, the emperor would have had rivers of liquid metal flowing through his afterlife empire for eternity. Surrounded by life-giving rivers of mercury, the emperor could reign over his replica kingdom for eternity and finally satisfy his lifelong dream of ruling forever. But just to be sure, he took out even more insurance. Sima Qian mentions more sinister features of these ancient rituals of death. Emperor Qin was accompanied on his journey into the next world by hundreds of slaves and concubines, all buried alive. He also had 8,000 terracotta warriors to guard him. And perhaps more practical against the grave robbers of the future, a system of lethal booby traps. Qin's ghostly defenses are our final ancient discovery. This is part of a tomb complex that was built in the third century BC as the eternal resting place for the first emperor of one of the world's most successful empires, China. Like something out of an Indiana Jones story, this enormous tomb was filled with weapons and treasures fit for the most powerful man on earth. With so much of value in the tomb, the emperor needed to know his eternal resting place would be safe from robbers or anyone seeking to desecrate the holy site. To ensure the safety of himself and his belongings, he ordered his engineers to produce solutions that seem right out of a movie. Booby trap defenses. 
in the historical records, they gave this information about the tomb. And so they have, in the, in the dark corridors of the tomb, they fixed a crossbow triggers there. So if any robbers dare to enter the tomb, the crossbow will release the arrows automatically. Ancient Discoveries is investigating the technology of the first emperor's tomb defenses. Our investigators use their knowledge of contemporary Chinese technology to speculate what these booby trap devices might have been. Well, what I've covered here are our sort of proposed reconstructions of the booby trap crossbows for Qin's tomb. There are several variants. Um, we've got several which just fire single arrows. Ancient Chinese crossbows had a draw strength of up to 300 pounds and fired bronze-tipped bolts two to three feet long. But probably will be bamboo. This is a fairly typical sort of largish arrow. Uh, we've got a, a nice sharp point on the front. There'll be a tang which runs down inside the bamboo. Other bows could fire several bolts at once. We've got a crossbow which is called uh, in Chinese a lian nu, which is a, a multi-bolt crossbow. This fires four bolts at once. There's one single string as per a normal bow. They do actually run in grooves, which is going to help to keep them going in a reasonably straight direction. Ancient Discoveries has built a replica of one of the entrances to the great tomb. So behind the walls of the corridors of the tomb were the covert devices. Now these were the devices that weren't intended to be seen. These were the ones that were going to cause the damage. And these were the booby trap devices that were going to help to protect the tomb from anyone that was going to try and intrude, who was going to try and rob the tomb, who was going to try and disturb the peace of the emperor. But of course we've got to find some way of actually triggering the device. Evidence from the period tells us that crossbows activated by tripwires were used to kill animals for food. In the set we've got here, the tripwires are fairly visible. They're quite light colored so that the camera will pick them up. But in actual fact, they probably would have been dark colored. They'd have been designed to actually blend with the background. So the whole idea is that somebody shambling or, or shuffling through the tomb would hit any number of these and, and each one would trigger a different kind of device. Richard tests the tripwires using blunt dummy arrows. Though the crossbows would have been excellent defense against the living, they offered little protection against the dead. The emperor commissioned a bodyguard of thousands to accompany him into the next world, a bodyguard to defend him from attack by the spirits of the dead. But I certainly believe that they are not just there to represent something, they are not a monument, but they are there to be used to provide, to, to provide a role, certainly, for the afterlife. With every passing day, archaeologists are uncovering more of these lifelike figures. Each of the 8,000 warriors is unique, with a personalized face. Now, a new theory is seeking to explain why the first emperor went to so much trouble to make his soldier guards individuals. The answer lies in the tumultuous origins of Qin's empire. The Chinese nation was born out of war. The unification was achieved purely by military force. Qin had more soldiers than any other Chinese state. They were organized by a totalitarian regime and they simply overwhelmed all their rivals one by one. China, as it became known, came into being under a reign of terror. The court of the first emperor was certainly run on very authoritarian lines, which emphasized strict punishments, inflexible laws, and the subordination of everything to the interests of the state. Life at the Qin court must have been pretty terrifying. The subjects of the infant state lived in fear of their new emperor, and the emperor lived in fear of his subjects. The emperor was also more and more paranoid as time went on. He moved secretly from one palace to another to avoid the possibility of assassination. The emperor remained paranoid, seemingly even in death. Fearful of the many enemies he had made in his ruthless rise to power, Emperor Qin surrounded himself with an elite bodyguard in this life that he planned to take with him into the next. They are the army that would have carried on into the afterlife. If a man needs an army in this life, he might well need an army in an afterlife too. A man who had been responsible for the deaths of thousands had every reason to be worried about who might be waiting for him on the other side. If we do believe that people after they died, they would continue to live and to hold on to their belongings, their power, etc., that would apply to the emperor himself, but also to everyone else. Now, if throughout his rule, he was killing or massacring 
thousands of people, including very powerful warriors and kings and princes, surely those people would be waiting for him in the afterlife to take revenge. The first emperor's paranoia and ego demanded that he be surrounded by an elite bodyguard. But he didn't order his real bodyguard to be buried with him. According to the ancient texts written by the historian Sima Qian, the Emperor Qin had his entire court buried alive with him. His servants, wives, musicians, entertainers, down to his favorite horse and chariot. The burden of accompanying the Emperor into the afterlife fell somewhat unfairly on his, his servants and followers. Um, his successor had his concubines buried alive with him and the workmen who worked on the tomb were also buried there partly in order to ensure that the, the secrets of the security devices remained secret. If he could order the deaths of hundreds of people from beyond the grave, why didn't he have his real bodyguard buried alive with him? The answer may be simple and also shed light on ancient Chinese belief. One reason for this is obviously that these were the toughest soldiers in the whole of China and it was not going to be easy to persuade them to go quietly as human sacrifices. The emperor was compelled to create the famous terracotta army because he realized that after his death there would be no one strong enough to force the toughest soldiers in the land to join him. Despite their loyalty, such devotion to their lord was more than he could reasonably expect and his successor might also not be willing to sacrifice such valuable assets. An army of 8,000 is not lightly given up. This left Qin with a dilemma. He couldn't take his real guard into the tomb, yet he was too paranoid to surround himself with strangers who may have been planted there to attack him in the afterlife. Each of these 8,000 terracotta warriors has been depicted as an individual with individually sculpted features. I think it's reasonable to assume that they represent the actual people who guarded the emperor in his life. After all, for someone as paranoid as him who lived in perpetual fear of being assassinated, he would not want to go into the next world accompanied by people he didn't know. It must have been reassuring that these images actually represented the few people on earth that he knew and could trust. If the features of the terracotta warriors are indeed portraits of real-life soldiers, then when we look at these stony, silent faces, we stare into the faces of men who once protected and fought for the founder of one of the greatest empires the world has ever known. The rituals of death surrounding Qin's tomb allow us to get right inside the mind of an emperor and a people who lived over 2,000 years ago. Just as ancient Egyptian death rituals reveal how they thought, what they believed, and what they wanted from life. This is a key to what they want in their long-term lives, but as a result, we really know what they wanted in their life. The reason for this is that rituals of death may be about death, but are actually performed, cherished, and enshrined, not by the dead, but by the living. Some practices surrounding death from the ancient world are still employed